to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection from the dead. Welcome to our study of the books of First and Second Peter. Peter is an interesting and very unique individual in the New Testament. He is always impulsive and impetuous as we see him. For example, when Jesus walks on the water, Peter's the go-getter who says, Lord, bid me to come to you. He gets out there, but you remember he begins to sink. Peter's the one who, when Jesus says, all of you are going to forsake me, he says, not I, Lord, I'll die with you. Jesus said, oh, yeah? Three times the rooster will crow and you'll deny me. Peter was one who was a go-getter, but Peter was one who needed to grow and progress in his faith. He needed to be reminded of certain truths that he had not yet grown in. And thus, first and second Peter, Peter writes about final reminders, things that we need to always keep close to our heart and remember. Well, what are those reminders that Peter wants us to know about, that God wants Christians to keep close to their heart to live faithful to Him? First of all, we need to realize that Christians have a living hope. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. The Scripture says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter reminds us, God reminds us, that our hope is not a dead hope, not a hope in something past, but a hope that is live and a hope that is based off of the future. Friend, what is it that when we face trial, when we face temptation, when we feel like giving up that keeps us going? We have a living hope. The Bible says in Hebrews 6 verse 18, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. It's what holds us down, keeps us firm and steadfast in the midst of tribulation. Colossians, 1, Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 talks about the hope of glory. There's the hope we have. 1 Timothy 1 verse 1, we're living in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promise before time began. I have the hope, Titus 1 verse 2, of one day living with God in heaven. And so I'm living in that hope in the here and now. But you notice chapter 1 verse 3 of 1 Peter says it's through the resurrection from the dead. Friend, were there no resurrection, we would not have a living hope. We would have no hope. The very fact that Jesus rose from the grave is the hope that Christians have. In fact, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that were it not for the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, our hope would be in vain. And yet we do have that wonderful hope. John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, Jesus expressed this hope when He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, Jesus said, though he may die, he'll never really die. What's the hope we have? We have the hope in the here and now that if we live faithful to God, we'll receive the crown of life. And so this life is not all there is. When we get down, when we get discouraged, remember, if we'll remain faithful here in this life, we've got that hope of eternal glory with God. Now what else does Peter want us to remember? He wants us to remember our hope but he also wants us to remember we have a heavenly inheritance. Notice chapter 1 verse 4 of the book of Peter says this. We have this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You've got an inheritance. Wouldn't it be great? to wake up one day to the knock on the door and you've been found out to be some heir 
of a, a millionaire or some heir of someone who had all these wonderful things in life. Friend, when we're a child of God, we have something far better than that. You are an heir of all that heaven has to offer. Imagine the wonder and the splendor of that. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, the Bible says we're, our, our citizenship is not on this earth, it's in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus who will transform our lowly body into His glorious body. We're not citizens here. We're true citizens in heaven itself. We've got a reservation. Can you imagine that idea? When I obey the gospel, when I become a Christian, I have a grand reservation awaiting me in heaven. You know, if you go on a journey and you go to a motel, the wonderful thing, wonderful thing about making plans ahead of time is when you get to that motel, you go up to the desk and you say your name and it's right there on the roll. You've got a room waiting for you. Friend, that's what our heavenly inheritance is like. If we've obeyed the gospel, if we've been faithful, our names are written in the book of life, Revelation 3, 4, and 5, and if we endure to the end, our name is on that grand roll in heaven itself, and we have that inheritance. Jesus talked about it. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Listen, in my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling. Were it not so, I would have told you. We have a reservation in that heavenly dwelling that God has made for His children. Matthew 25, verse 46, Jesus said, The righteous will go away into eternal life. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 and 2, If this tent, our earthly body, is destroyed, we have a building from God, eternal in the heavens, not made with hands. Don't you want to go? Friend, don't you want to go to heaven? You've got to constantly remind yourself that heaven is going to be worth whatever we have to endure. Romans 8, verse 18, Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present world, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall one day be revealed in us. It doesn't matter what I face, what trials come into life, let's keep focused on heaven. That's what Peter reminds us of. A third reminder that Peter gives us is that we need to stay faithful because of the wonder of salvation that God has given to each one of us. Notice 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now notice, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would to come. Notice, the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets searched and inquired of. It was something they wanted to know. God's been working toward that from eternity. And friend, listen, we have that salvation if we've obeyed the gospel. And so what's a reminder? I need to remind myself every day, you are a child of God. You have been saved, you can currently be saved, and you will be saved in heaven if you remain faithful. The Bible says in 1 John 2, verse 25, this is the promise He has promised us eternal life. Now, friend, to really appreciate salvation, you've got to go back a little bit and think about the despair of sin and the state you're in before. Romans 3.23, the Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages, the salary of that sin is death. Our sins have separated us from God. Isaiah 59.1 and 2, and as the psalmist said in Psalm 38 verses 4 and 5, my sins have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me to bear. And so when you think about salvation and the wonder of it, think about where you were. All of us have been lost in sin and headed down the path to hell. But because of God's love and because of salvation, we've been relieved from that burden. God said to those who obeyed the gospel in the new covenant, I'll be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. Hebrews 8 verses 12 and 13. Because of what Jesus did for me, I can have salvation. He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Look at the, the beauty 
of God's scheme of redemption. God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him from the beginning of time. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, God has been planning, working, bringing together salvation. And friend, we are here. We in the New Testament age have the privilege of taking part in that salvation. So remind ourselves, let's be reminded, we have the blessing of being saved. Remember also, Peter says, that to receive this, like God, you've got to be holy, live a holy life. Look in 1 Peter chapter 1 and notice what the Bible says in verses 15 and 16. Peter says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Leviticus 11.44, Be holy, for I am holy. Friend, when we think about things that constantly must weigh on our mind, things that motivate us and propel us, one of those is the challenge to be holy. And here's why it's something we must possess. Hebrews 12 verse 14 says this, Without holiness, no one will see God. Habakkuk 1 verse 13 tells us, God is of purer eyes than to behold evil, and He cannot look upon wickedness. And so if God cannot look upon wickedness, if His Son has come to perfect us, and He has, we've got to do our best to live a holy life. Now, I understand as well as you that none of us, we're not saying today you've got to live perfect. Nobody's perfect. We all at times have fallen short, do fall short at times. But here's what holiness means. Holiness means that I'm going to try to walk in the light every day. 1 John 1 verse 7. If I fall, I'm going to confess and I'm going to repent of my sin. 1 John 1 verses 8 and 9. And I'm going to try every day to be a sacrifice for Jesus. Paul said in Romans 12 1. I beg you by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And so be holy. That means don't get caught up in the things of the world. Don't get contaminated by sin again. Stay away from that lifestyle. Run from it if you have to. Do whatever it takes to remember to be holy every day. And friend, here's the motivation. The motivation for remembering these things, the motivation for being holy, I believe is based in that great eternal plan that God made for mankind. Notice 1 Peter 1, verses 19 and 20. Look at the beauty of these verses. The Bible says, We were not redeemed with corruptible things, verse 18, like silver or gold. Rather, verse 19, With the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and spot, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. When I think about being holy, when I'm motivated to live for Jesus, what is it that challenges me? Before the first second on the time of clock had ticked, God had already begun to make a plan of salvation. 2 Timothy 1 verses 9 through 10, from the before the foundation of the world, God made that. Titus 1 verse 2, we're living in hope of eternal life, which God who promised before time began, before this world was even started, God knew He'd make man in His divine wisdom. He knew man would sin, and God could have chosen not to do any of that. But He did anyway, and He already knew He would have to make a way of salvation for us. Friend, don't you see in that the, the eternal love of God Look at what God knew He'd have to go through, the Holy Spirit would have to go through, men and women throughout centuries would have to go through, and ultimately His Son would have to go through. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Do we realize that God knew His Son would have to bleed and suffer and die for us? Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 28, As the institute of the Lord's Supper, this is my blood of the new covenant, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. Christ knew. He is God. John 1, 1, Genesis 1, 26. He knew those things would have to happen. Acts 20, verse 28, Jesus purchased the church. There's the eternal plan of God. Ephesians 3, 10, 11, Jesus purchased the church with His own blood. Colossians 1, 14, we have redemption through His blood. Revelation 1 verse 5, we're washed and cleansed in the blood of Christ. And so when I think about reminders, when I think about living a holy life, what challenges me to do that? 
friend, the God of heaven, loved me and he loved you so deeply that he had already made a plan before Adam and Eve made that first sin. We need to realize the importance of God's love and how deeply he cares for us. What else do we need to remember today? Remember, you are a new creature in Christ. In Christ, you're a new creature. You have a second chance. Look in 1 Peter 1, verse 23 through 25. The Bible says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers, its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Peter reminds us that if we're going to be faithful to God, if we're going to really live the life God wants us to, we've got to realize we're a new creature. Friend, when we obey the gospel, we put all the past behind us and we got a second chance. Romans 6, 1 through 4 talks about it. We Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We die to sin, we're buried with Him in baptism, and we're raised to walk in a newness of life. Listen to the wonderful words of 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. It is a privilege to be a Christian, and you've got to put that past life behind you. You can no longer live like that. In fact, Peter will say in 1 Peter 2, verse 1, you've got to lay aside all malice and envy and wickedness and deceit, all those ungodly things you used to be a part of, You've got to put behind you, and that's a reminder each one of us needs every day of our life. Now, what else must we do? Well, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, verse 2, a reminder that will always be present for the child of God. In verse 2, Peter says we've got to continue to grow. As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. A baby has that insatiable desire to eat. And if you don't get him what he wants, everybody knows he's going to be unhappy and he's going to let everybody know about it. Uh, the baby has got to grow. He's got to eat. He's got to be fed. We are like that in the spiritual sense. We've got to take the word and grow by it. Matthew 5 verse 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Peter says later in 2 Peter 3 verse 18, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That means that if we've been in the church for a while, maybe 10, 20, 30 years, we ought to be teachers. We don't need someone to teach us again the first principles, the oracles of God. Hebrews 5, verses 12 through 14. That means we've got to break up our fallow ground, that which we've not studied, that which we've not grown in, that which we've not worked on in our life. We got to break it up. Hosea 10 verse 12 and work on it. Like those in Acts chapter 17 verse 11, we've got to search the scriptures every day. And so remember, when you become a child of God, the work's not over. The work has just begun and you've got to grow every day. And you've got to have an insatiable appetite for the word of good, God because we've tasted how good that word is. Now in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter reminds us that Christ is like four different types of stones, and so are Christians. He is a living stone. He is a chief cornerstone. He was a rejected stone and a stone of stumbling. Remember, we have that living hope because we've accessed the living stone, Jesus himself. He's the chief cornerstone. What's that mean? He's that locking piece that brings it all together. Without Jesus, there is no hope, and he must be the chief cornerstone in your life. Everything we do must be because of our love and motivation that Jesus gives us. He's the rejected stone. Friend, being a Christian doesn't mean everybody's going to like you. There are going to be times when you have to say the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15, and people are going to reject that, reject Christ, and reject your lifestyle. But that ought not to bring us to shame. It ought to give us glory. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. 1 Peter 4, verse 16. And Jesus at times is a stone of stumbling in the things we say. People will not always obey and realize the importance of. But Peter also reminds us of this. Here's a very viable and valid point for Christians today. And it's this. When it comes to matters of the flesh, I need to remember abstinence is the only biblical approach to the lust of the flesh. 
Now, I want you to look in the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 2 and notice what it says in verse 11. Peter says, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, here's the key word, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. God's plan is not a plan of safety. God's plan is a plan of abstinence. If we're going to fulfill the commands of God in the areas of the lust of the flesh, we've got to abstain from things that are not right. The only place sexual lust, sexuality is to be fulfilled is inside the marriage bond. Hebrews 13 verse 4, Marriage is honorable, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Every area that does not fit that pattern, the pattern of marriage, is outside the boundary and the guideline of God, and you must abstain from that. Young people, listen carefully. If you are going to please God in matters that relate to this, you have got to abstain from the lust of the flesh. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22, we're to abstain from every appearance of evil. Even if it seems evil, if it's evil to the world and ungodly, we need to stay away from that. James 4 verse 4 says, if not, we're adulterers and adulteresses and we have fellowship with the world. Think of a couple of people in the Bible. One who didn't abstain. Solomon was the wisest man. God gave him wisdom from above, but for such a wise man, he made some really foolish choices when it came to the lust of the flesh. Solomon had, Solomon had multiple wives and concubines, and if you read 1 Kings chapter 11, those wives and concubines led him away from God. He didn't abstain. He gave in, and as a result, sin took hold in his life. Then think of another man, Joseph. Joseph is a powerful example of abstaining from lust of the flesh. Potiphar's wife has a, an attraction to Joseph. She, over a period of time, tries to get Joseph to lie with her. Finally, one day, she catches him in the house alone. She there embraces, tries to get him to again to have relations with her. And Joseph leaves his garment in their hand and runs out of the house. Now, there are consequences to that. She hollers that he's done something when he hasn't. But Joseph did what was right, and he's ultimately vindicated by God. Friend, we've got to take that example. 1 Timothy chapter 6, flee youthful lust. We've got to remember to abstain from the lust of the flesh. Now, as a Christian, I also have the reminder of my responsibility now to others. What is that responsibility? Well, in verses 13 through 20, it tells us we're to respect and honor all people. I've got to give respect to those who are due respect, those who are older, those who are wiser, those who are leaders in the congregation. I've got to love the brotherhood. You know, the church is a wonderful thing. And part of, the, part of my reminder is I need to realize the brotherhood's important. I've got to fear God, respect Him all the days of my life, and give Him the honor and glory that He deserves. I've got to honor the king and the governmental rulers. The Bible says that in 1 Peter 3 or 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 20. You know, Jesus said it, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. The Bible teaches in Romans 13, 1 following, we've got to obey the laws of the land. And so I've got to give respect to those who are due respect. But friend, as much as anything, Peter encourages us as Christians to follow the example of Jesus. Friend, when we think about reminders, what is a reminder Peter needed to know? He needed to know he wasn't following Jesus at times and he needed to learn what it really meant to follow Jesus. And so it does for us as well. Notice 1 Peter 2, verse 21 through 22. The Bible says, concerning the following of Jesus, that we are for this to you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Notice that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. We've got to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. What's that mean? Do not sin or slander when others do that to you. He committed no sin, nor was guile found in his mouth. Were people trying to tempt Jesus to do that? Well, think about this. They said to him on the cross, If you're the Son of God, bring yourself down from there. They were trying to get Jesus to sin, to give in to what they wanted. God says, be angry and sin not. Psalm 4 and verse 4. We've got to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so we need not let people tempt us. That's part of growing. We don't revile or get angry back 
we do the will of God. Look in verse 23. He was reviled. He did not revile back or in return. When people made fun of Jesus, Jesus from the cross did not respond in a popular fashion like that. You know, people say today, don't get mad, get even. Friend, that's not a Christian motto. The Christian motto is, don't get mad, let God get even. Romans 12, verse 17 and 18, God says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We love our enemies, Matthew chapter 6. We do good to those who use us and who are spiteful toward us, Matthew 5, verse 12 through 14. We try to help those who are lost in sin, even if they're not good to us, because we want them to go to heaven. And so that's what it means. Don't sin or slander, don't revile, and you've got to selflessly submit your life to the will of God. Verse 24 of 1 Peter 2, notice the scripture says this of Jesus. He himself bore our sins in his own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. What does it mean to follow the example of Jesus? Jesus selflessly submitted to the will of God. And friends, when I walk in his footsteps, I've got to do the same. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 26? Jesus is in the garden. He knows his hour of trial is upon him. And although he knows he wants to do the will of God in the flesh, he cries out, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but thine be done. Friend, that's the attitude of following Jesus. Obedience, my friends, to God and to Jesus will truly change the direction of each one of our lives. Friend, we're reminding you today, Peter's reminding us of what it really means to live for Jesus. We ask you today, are you a child of God? Do you have that living hope? Do you have uh, the forgiveness of sins? Are you sure that heavenly inheritance is yours? And are you saved today? Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel, you can do that today. You've got to hear the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. You must believe that Jesus is God's Son, John 8, 24. You've got to make changes in your life and repent, Luke chapter 13, verse 3. You've got to confess the name of Jesus before men, Romans 10, verse 10. And you must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. If you've not done that, friend, you don't have that hope, but you can today. As a child of God, we hope that this lesson will encourage each one of us to never give up, to always follow in the footsteps of Jesus and to realize we are born again, we are children of God, and we need to remember it is the greatest privilege in all the world. May God bless us as we strive to live according to the gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.